Understanding how fluorescence works is a critical aspect of understanding flow cytometry. This tutorial will try to give you the fundamentals of fluorescence and the difference between excitation and emission. So what is excitation? You get excitation when you use a particular wavelength light source to raise the energy of an electron in a molecule called a fluorochrome or a chromophore. We mostly use lasers in flow cytometry, so let's concentrate on lasers in this cytorial. Some flow cytometers have only one light source, but most have several. Here are the common lasers. First, the 405 nanometer violet line. It's not quite UV, but many people call it UV regardless. Then probably the most common, the 488 nanometer line from an argon laser the 532 nanometer green line, the 568 nanometer yellow line, often coming from krypton lasers, and finally a red line, often about 632 nanometers, but can be 660 nanometers or even higher. These are the most common lasers you'll find in flow cytometers today. Of course, you can also get a true UV laser at 350 nanometers if you need that for a particular application, like sperm cell sorting or excitation of Indo, Herxt, or DAPI. Remember that the excitation wavelength in flow cytometry is always lower than the emission wavelength since nonlinear systems are not common in this field. Excitation is when we use one wavelength of light source to raise the energy of an electron to an excited state in a chemical called a fluorochrome. While we always know the excitation wavelength of our laser, we have to look carefully at where these wavelengths fit on the visible spectrum. When we place known lasers, we get something like this chart. Note that when we combine lots of fluorescent dyes, we cover the entirety of the visible spectrum, and conveniently the lasers we use are nicely sequenced along this spectral chart. Now, we know we can use several lasers on a system to excite different fluorochromes. So we know something about the front end of the flow cytometer, the excitation side. What about the emission side? Let's remind ourselves what fluorescence is. Let's state it again. Fluorescence is defined as the photon emission as an electron returns from an excited state to ground state. The key thing to understand is that the emission wavelength in flow cytometry is always longer than the excitation. Of course, this means that the energy level of the emission photon is much lower than the excitation photon. There are several ways to describe this phenomena, but we often explain this by using a spectral display called a Jablonski diagram. Alexander Jablonski was born in 1899 and, among other things, studied fluorescence. In 1933, he began to understand the energy loss in fluorescence molecules and published in this area. As you can see, the excited energy level is higher than the emission level. The loss of energy when a molecule returns to ground state is reflected in the emission being a wavelength sometimes tens or more nanometers lower than the excitation line. Here's another way of showing Jablonski's diagram, but the result is the same. Whatever the wavelength of the excited molecule is, the emission will be lower in energy and higher in wavelength. There are lots of other ways for molecules to lose energy, but for the moment, we'll just focus on fluorescence. Fluorochromes are defined as the photon emission as the electron returns from an excited state to its ground state. Okay, this is getting complicated, so let's review. We have a dye. Let's call this one a fluorescein-like molecule. We excite it with a laser. In this case, we'll use an argon laser line. That is the most common line used in flow cytometry, and that is 488 nanometers. It really is blue. You see that in this diagram. The line with the arrow is the excitation line, and the blue area is the absorbance distribution. The green area is the emission spectrum of that fluorochrome. And note, we refer to the excitation or absorption spectrum and the emission spectrum. In a moment, we'll give the difference between these two curves a very special name, but not yet. Okay, so what the heck is a chromophore anyway? It's a good question. Chromophores are components of molecules which absorb light, and these are often aromatic rings like this. 
And this opens up the opportunity for us to consider a few rules of thumb, which we should remember about chromophores. First rule of thumb, the wavelength of absorption is related to the size of the chromophore. Second rule of thumb, small chromophores have high energy and therefore shorter wavelengths. Good example you all know would be DAPI or Herx. These are both UV absorbers, so very low wavelength excitation, but they are also high energy emitters. Now you know why I drew these in violet. And the third rule of thumb, that is that large chromophores have lower energy and thus longer wavelengths. And it would not surprise you to know that these molecules are much larger. An excellent example would be Psi 5.5 or something like APC or alpha-cyanin. Okay, time for a review again and some new information. First, some molecules have an absorption profile that allows them to change states. Here is a common dye. You see it can have an odd shape. Now, let's add the emission profile. Okay, we saw this before, but let's take a look at each profile. If we drew a line at the point of each profile where there's a maxima, we would see two lines. And if we looked at the difference between the two maxima, we would have identified Stokes shift. By now, I'm sure you're expecting me to draw a picture of George Stokes, who lived from 1819 to 1903. The Stokes shift, named after George Stokes, provides another rule of thumb. The Stokes shift is the energy difference between the highest energy peak of the absorbance and the highest energy of the emission peak. Our ultimate goal is to find fluorochromes, or chromophores if you prefer, where the Stokes shift is as large as possible. This defines an excellent candidate for a fluorophore. Okay, time to go back and review some important definitions yet again. One, basic quantum mechanics requires that molecules absorb energy as quanta, or photons, based upon a criteria specific for each molecular structure. Two, absorption of a photon raises the molecule from ground state to an excited state. And three, the total energy is the sum of all components, the electronic, the vibrational, rotational, translation, spin orientation energies, all of these, even though vibrational energies are really quite small. And four, the structure of the molecule dictates the likelihood of absorption of energy to raise the energy state to an excited one. If you can grasp these four basic principles, it'll take you a long way towards understanding fluorescence. Unfortunately, there are a few other important terms you should understand, or at least know the basics. Extinction coefficient. This refers to a single wavelength, usually the absorption maximum. The cross-sectional area of a molecule determines how efficient it will absorb photons. Quantum yield. This is a measure of the integrated photon emission over the fluorophore spectral band. In fact, it's approximately equivalent to the number of excitation photons required to get one emission photon. It's how efficient that molecule is. At subsaturation excitation rates, fluorescence intensity is proportional to the product of the extinction coefficient and the quantum yield. Hey, just give me the basics, please. I said earlier that chromophores are components of molecules that absorb light. These are often aromatic ring compounds. So what are the key features of fluorescent molecules? Here are the take home messages. You need a large extinction coefficient at the region of excitation. You need a high quantum yield. You would like to have an optimal excitation wavelength for the light source that you have. In terms of photostability, we don't want the molecule to break down easily. And the excited state lifetime needs to fit with the detection system capability. And finally, there needs to be minimal 
perturbation by the probe. That means it has to have low toxicity and the probe itself does no damage to the biology we are observing. These are the key features that lead to good fluorescent molecules. So keep this short cytorial in mind when you think about your next experiment and ask your colleagues if they understand all this. Okay, I can hear reactions already. You thought you were going to get a tutorial on Fitzy and PE and Sci-5. Well, in fact, you really did. It's just that I explained it in terms you should really understand, as well as why these molecules react the way they do. And that's the goal of this tutorial. And you got it all in 10 minutes compared to the regular 50-minute class lecture.